We're at the Site C Summit in Victoria, British Columbia. It's Saturday, January the 27th. Uh, I'm talking to Damien Gillis of the Common Sense Canadian. That's and much else as well. And you said that to you one of the most important issues now, although you didn't realize it earlier on, was the geology around mm. where the dam is being built. Can mm. you talk about that? Sure. I should have realized this sooner because I was here in 2010 and uh, at an event that was called the Paddle to the Premier. A lot of people from the Peace Valley came down here to take their message to uh, then Premier Gordon Campbell uh, of all their concerns of, about why they didn't want this project built. And one of the people I talked to there was a man named Dick Ardill, who's a longtime farmer. My family was a pioneer settler family in the valley as well. We lost our ranch to the first big dam uh, on the piece, the Willison Reservoir. Uh, and so, but this is another family from the same kind of vintage. We're talking over a hundred years ago that settled there, the Ardills. And, and Dick's been farming that land. He must have been in his late 80s at the time. Uh, this is going back eight years ago. And what he, he put it really simply, which is, he can talk about all this other stuff, but uh, you, you can't build the dam there because of this, the lack of stability of the banks and the soils. We're talking about basically uh, shales and clays and sand and, and silt. Uh, and you know, he wasn't speaking about it as a geologist, but rather somebody who's just tilled the land and has spent a lot of time on it. His family goes way back. And, uh, and we saw the same sort of thing. Uh, uh, my grandfather had another piece of land uh, that was not supposed to be flooded by the Williston and, and with all the shoreline erosion that happened over the years it basically eventually became untenable and he got some minor compensation. But this is something that, that, you know, that happened with the Williston and uh, this particular tract of the valley is particularly prone to landslides and we see now flash forward how prescient that warning was uh, because many of the major delays and cost overruns with the project can be associated with these what they call tension cracks but they're basically slides uh, around the dam site uh, that have really caused them to delay construction there are major problems and delays with the diversion tunnels uh, that they require before they can build the main component of the dam they need to have these diversion tunnels built and so the contractor is now in a dispute with the hydro over they, they want more money uh, and, and added, I think it's 435 days uh, to the schedule uh, for this component of the project. Um, and, and this is part of a pattern as we've seen these costs continue to rise. Uh, and I think it doesn't really matter whether, you know, John Horgan announced when he announced the decision, he said we're going to put a, a panel in place to make sure that the, the costs are kept in check. He upped it again to 10.7 billion. And this is from, you know, uh, back in the mid-2000s when the Liberals started talking about this project again, which has been on the books for decades, but we were in the region of five to six and a half billion dollars, so now we're up to 10.7. Um, and he said, you know, we'll put, we'll put this group in place to keep the costs in check. Well, they can do, do whatever they want, all the cost checking they want, if, this, if the geology is faulty and they can't find a way around that. Uh, which there's no real indication that they have at this point, then the costs are just going to keep spiraling up. And, uh, you know, there's, it, I think it's still an open question as to whether this thing can really be feasibly constructed at any cost. Now, two things come to mind. One is that most people don't know about that because it hasn't been an issue mm -hmm. uh, in the many years of this project. It's not really been told to the public what challenges are faced there. Mm -hmm. And secondly, John Horgan, knowing all of this, still decided to go ahead. It's interesting to me to sort of consider like how much did they really internalize, you know, there's a lot of the, the staff, the, the main deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers, uh, you know, who surround the, the, the NDP government today are, are holdovers from the, uh, from the Liberal government. And it's clear that they were getting a lot of uh, advice kind of filtered up the chain that really was pushing, it was, it was framed in a way that really, really pushing for the dam to be built. So I, I you know, and, and I'll, I'll grant you that, you know, this is an issue I've been following for 10 years. I have a sort of, like I say, a personal interest. My family's from the region. 
Uh, but it, it's also like a massive energy project and a hugely expensive, the biggest, most expensive infrastructure project we built. So I think, you know, all British Columbia should be concerned about this. Um, and in, in you know, in all the years that I've kind of followed the issue, there are a lot of dimensions to it. So I don't know if it, this is really a matter of there's, uh, they didn't kind of focus on the the, the stuff they should have, and, and he didn't fully understand it, or whether he understood it and just kind of dismissed it or ignored it because it was inconvenient. I'm not sure. I don't think that's an excuse. Uh, but part of the problem, and I think you alluded to this earlier, is. We haven't had a, a media that has really forced these issues to the surface, and I'm speaking mostly of the kind of the conventional uh, media, which is not really properly uh, covered issues like like the ones I'm talking about. They haven't stayed on top of this, the the cost. They haven't uh, looked at uh, the the true kind of they bought into kind of the position of this is a clean uh, energy project. Uh, they they haven't properly reported on. Uh, on the, the, the nature of the, uh, the impacts on First Nations and how this constitutes a major breach of the NDP's commitment to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there's a whole suite of things that they haven't really properly, the media hasn't properly considered. So I think that's part of it is that um, the public isn't as informed about these things, that the, the government isn't getting the kind of pressure that it should uh, on these different fronts. My own feeling is, and I won't say I'm right, but this is my thought, that the NDP position has been a sham for many, many years. Mm -hmm. They were always going to do what somebody told them to do, whoever it is that runs this province. Yeah. I'm sure John Horgan and the rest of them would have preferred if the people who, who tell them what to do had said, well, we're going to stop it. It's just too much of a disaster. But they didn't. They said, go ahead, and, and, and John Horgan and the gang did it. Yeah. Would you say I'm way off base there, or? Well, n no, and, and first of all, it depends who you're, who they is. Yeah. They should have been the BC Utilities Commission in, the in this situation. Sure. Yeah, but you know they committed to uh, to sending this to the Utilities Commission, where it should have gone in the first place, and it didn't under the Liberals. Uh, and they should have also uh, committed to basically respecting the spirit of what the report said. Instead what you had was, and I think the, the they in this situation is actually senior bureaucrats, staff within the government who again are, are liberal holdovers and, and, and are being long time committed to this project and they have a way of, of kind of narrowing down the scope of information that they pass up the chain to their bosses uh, and, and, and presenting a particular kind of picture and taking certain things out of context. And what happened that was really unusual here is you had two uh, uh, senior staff, one of them was named, is named Dave Nicolaisen, and I, I can't remember the, the woman's name, that they wrote a letter uh, to the Utilities Commission after the report came out, and it was very, as Harry Swain, who ran the joint review panel, he's commented on this, just how unprecedented this is and how snarky this letter was and it was essentially they were browbeating the utilities commission into changing their report and what ended up coming out of it was some uh, some amendments which really gave them a little bit of daylight or gave them a little bit more to work with in terms of you know making the economic case that Oregon eventually made to the public which is totally faulty uh, but here you have a couple of senior bureaucrats who are telling an independent regulator to change their findings. Uh, th that is totally inconsistent with how that kind of uh, system, that regulatory system should work. Uh, the other thing is, you know, they talked about how they, they, uh, they were going to have to up rates on, on uh, tax or on rate payers. Uh, because, of, you know, if, if they cancel the project, we'd have to absorb this hit. That's not how it works. Uh, as was outlined in this, this conference here by people who understand elect electrical regulatory utility uh, regulation uh, all around North America, that's not how it works. Uh, what happens is the government goes back to the Utilities Commission. They make the decision. And in, in, in consideration of all the different concerns, they'll listen to the government and say, well, uh, we have some concerns. We don't want rates to go up immediately on people too much. And we also need to kind of find a way to balance how much of this is going to be absorbed on Hydro's books and how much is going to be absorbed on on, uh, on our public debt. And 
and there is a lot of flexibility within uh, the, the utility regulator, BC Utilities Commission can weigh all these different factors and they can decide uh, how long to amortize this debt over and where to assign it. And so the idea that the government, based on the direction of these bureaucrats, is going to tell the, the regulator what to do and, and, and also tell it the wrong thing to do, that basically just strengthens their case for continuing with the project. Uh, the whole thing was, was really uh, very manipulative and, and it totally kind of defeats the purpose of going to an independent regulator. If you're not going to listen to what they have to say, if you're not going to respect the, the, you know, the essence of their findings, and you're going to impose your own uh, you know, trumped up kind of interpretation of this in order to justify doing something that you apparently always wanted to do in the first place, which it goes back to your point. Um, I, I think the fix has been in you know, on this decision for a long time. I think you're right about that. And, uh, and they created just enough justification to be able to come to the public and, 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 and you know, make this statement. Uh, but a lot of people uh, who really know what they're talking about are not buying it. Just to be clear, last question. Um, there was nothing in the BCUC report that a group of people who had promised for years, really promised their supporters that this was not going to go ahead. There was nothing in the BCUC report that would make them change their minds. There was nothing, sorry, can you... Yeah, like, the NDP went to the BCUC. Yeah. The NDP had said, We're, you know, we really don't want to move this ahead. Right. They went to the BCUC, the BCUC presented them with a report. There was nothing in that report that would have... That would say, oh, no, you, you're going to have to go ahead with this. Yeah, no, it was quite... And, and the only little sliver of kind of where, where some of that rationale came in was on this amendment that they were kind of bullwhipped into, uh, in, into putting out after the fact. I mean, this is like the, the, they listened to uh, all the different testimony, they've done the investigation, um, you know, they've, they've gone into their deliberations and issued their report. There should be no more discussion at that point about, oh, yeah, but we didn't like this part of it. So and I don't even understand that. Two people wrote a letter. That's right. To the B and the BCUC actually amended their report? They did. What did yeah. they say? They basically changed uh, some of their cost interpretations and made it a little bit more. In the initial report, there was essentially no cost difference, no, no significant uh, appreciable cost difference between those two options of either going ahead with the project or or canceling it and what they the numbers that they tweaked some of their their calculations uh, was just enough to create a few hundred million dollars of extra kind of space in between those two options that gave the proponents of continuing with the project the ammunition that they needed to kind of to make this more to yeah it's, it, to make this argument but it's still it was it was a completely um, uh, in nonsensical argument as many of these and and the thing is if you're in the if you're in the government and you're overwhelmed by all this information, you're in cabinet and there's so much here to process, and you're not an energy expert, uh, and so you, you're going to depend on on other people to kind of summarize and focus what's important to you. One really great way of doing that would be to give extra weight to people who, uh, you know, have no skin in the game, who are independent of the process. They're not political. They're outside of uh, this. You know this system of arguing over Site C for a number of years. Uh, they're not part of the previous Liberal government. Uh, they don't have an agenda in terms of they're going to make money off the project if it goes forward or their workers are going to get jobs from it. And, and we had a number of an unprecedented kind of quality and caliber of people in this situation. Dr. Harry Swain, who has a, a long CV of, of, of um, deputy ministerial roles and, and uh, a joint review panel, head, head, he was the head of this joint review panel, he's led many others in the past, uh, and, and somebody who really knows his stuff. He was the man who was in charge of reviewing this project in the first place. I've never seen a situation where the head of a review panel like that later comes out and says, you know, let me tell you, because it, they're constrained, they're not asked to, to say yes or no to the project, they give a report and it says kind of on the one hand or on the other hand, there were a lot of these issues questioning the need for the project, this was under the Liberal government. Um, 
And, and so he had already kind of done that, and when the liberals decided to go ahead with it, he was like, well, they didn't really read the, my report, our report very well. He felt, you know, he was retiring, and he felt compelled that, to go on the public record and start really uh, telling people what he really thinks in unvarnished terms. And he has uh, poked holes in all of these economic arguments that were given to us, and he said, you know, this is not going to affect our credit rating. In fact, it's the opposite. Going ahead with the project is what is going to endanger our credit rating. Uh, there's not going to be an, a big rate spike from going in, but it does have a long-term uh, risk to our to our rates going up if we do build it. So he kind of said the exact opposite of what these you know government and uh, uh, staff and lobbyists were telling the NDP. We have Mark Eliasson, who's the former CEO of BC Hydro. He's out of the game. He's not working for anybody right now. He was an independent intervener in, in the in the BC Utilities Commission and the JRP. And so. These are people who are really knowledgeable people who aren't, you know, essentially corrupted by a particular kind of, uh, they're not beholden to anybody. And, and those are voices that should have really been listened to. That, that's shocking when people of that pedigree and that level of knowledge on, on this particular issue are, are coming forward and making these statements and the government doesn't, you know, give it the weight that it deserves. And instead, they're putting the, the voices of, of lobbyists and uh, and liberal ex liberal uh, deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers, they're that's what they chose to listen to, um, not these independent experts. Damien, you said that very very well. It really, you know, thank you very much. <laughs>